The execution of criminals has been used by nearly all societies to deter them from engaging in unlawful activities. But capital offenses, or crimes that are punishable by death, vary widely according to federal and state laws. In fact, only 18 of the 50 U.S. states have abolished the death penalty. There are several moral and economic consequences surrounding capital punishment, but unknown to the general public are the bureaucratic, political, and institutional incentives of keeping the death penalty. These deeper motives are what have driven this shifting paradigm of capital punishment in the last two centuries. But before we examine the effects of this controversial phenomenon, let's dive into its deadly history. In the 19th century, U.S. law had not only accepted capital punishment, but required it in certain murder cases. A jury that convicted a defendant of capital murder could only endorse the death penalty because it was illegal to propose an alternative punishment. But there was a loophole. A jury that considered a defendant guilty of a capital crime, but didn't think he or she deserved execution, could vote for a not guilty verdict, an outcome called jury nullification. In the early 1900s, most states adopted a revised death penalty law that agreed to give jurors the option of choosing between the death penalty or giving the convicted criminal a life sentence. Still, nearly 30 years later, executions in the United States peaked at a rate of 200 per year. Death sentences were given fairly frequently until the 1960s, when the practice began to face strong moral, legal, and political opposition. By 2010, the number of executions carried out in the United States dropped to just 46, compared to 98 in 1999 and 85 in 2000. In 2016, only 20 occurred nationwide. But even with the sharp decline in the number of executions, nearly 49% of Americans still support the death penalty. Proponents for the death penalty argue that it properly delivers justice to those who've killed others. After all, it gives retribution against perpetrators and makes sure that they're held accountable for their actions. No punishment other than death equates to that of the crime of murder. The death penalty is inarguably cheaper than life imprisonment without parole. Violent criminals and murderers take away tax dollars from education and health care. Capital punishment deters would-be criminals to, to commit felonies. Each execution results, on an average, in 18 fewer murders, and the death penalty might even mitigate the problem of overpopulation in the prison system. As a whole, the death penalty protects the general public. Civilians can easily be put in danger by violent offenders who either escape prison or are paroled early. Fellow prisoners are also at a high risk of assault, as well as guards and prison officers who are sometimes killed by unruly inmates. Supporters of the death penalty contend that it's constitutional and that it doesn't violate the Eighth Amendment, which prohibits the federal government from imposing excessive bail, fines, and cruel and unusual punishments, including torture. The opposition, however, argues that lethal injection can be considered cruel and unusual, especially when used on defenseless inmates who are occasionally found innocent after the execution. Indeed, some criminals suffered from mental illness or had clouded judgment at the time of their crimes. Innocent people are sometimes wrongly executed, although proponents for the penalty argue that DNA testing can now eliminate uncertainty. Economically, the death penalty is an added cost to the government's budget and taxpayers' money. Its costs not only include the money needed for lethal injection, but also legal costs such as compensation for a state-supplied attorney, pre-trial costs for forensic evidence, jury selection, trial costs, incarceration costs, and costs of potential appeals. In fact, if the state of California alone replaced the death penalty with life without parole, it would save $1 billion in taxpayer money over the next five years. The price of accommodating just one death row inmate a year is $90,000 higher than that for someone serving life without parole. Plus, death row inmates are generally imprisoned for 10 to 15 years before execution. On average, each death penalty process costs California nearly $250 million. There are billions of dollars involved in the capital punishment cycle. Capital punishment is a business, and the money involved in the death penalty points to a wealth of concealed institutional incentives that almost never make major news headlines.
Indeed, prosecutors in lower courts have great incentives to seek and impose the death penalty, even when it's not appropriate. Individuals assigned to death penalty cases have political and professional ambitions. Prosecutors want to become district attorneys who want to become judges or attorneys general, and all of these individuals want to be re-elected. Of the 38 states that allow the death penalty, 32 have regular elections for judges. In eight of them, judges are the sole individuals who determine whether a defendant will receive the death sentence. Tough on crime credentials help these officials. At alarming rates, judges who overturn a death sentence are challenged for being soft on crime. The elected judges on Alabama Supreme Court, for one, made valiant efforts to ensure that the public didn't criticize their views. They recently implemented plans to speed up the executions of those on death row. They also threatened to set execution dates even for those who haven't finished the appeal process. Because faulty sentences are often overturned much, much later than the initial trial, those securing death sentences rarely have to face the consequences of poorly conceived conviction and sentence. Some judges, however, are highly sensitive to these threats, and their paranoia is displayed in their election campaigns. John Quatman, a California Superior Court candidate, listed the number of killers he sent to death row as one of his primary qualifications for a judge. In Texas, Renee Haas advertised her strong support for the death penalty on her Supreme Court campaign literature, even though the Texas Supreme Court doesn't handle any criminal appeals. When a local prosecutor sends a convicted felon to prison, the cost of keeping him or her locked up, approximately $31,286 per year, is paid for entirely by the state, not the county where the prosecutor holds office. This is a political issue because local prosecutors can be very aggressive in their charging decisions, since they don't have to worry about how much it'll cost the local taxpayers who elected them in the first place. These political implications can be mitigated if state governments pursued one of the many alternatives to the death penalty. Support for the death penalty diminishes greatly when viable alternatives are promoted. Longer jail sentences are considered by human rights activists to be more humane. Longer jail sentences explicitly call for no possibility of parole, adding an extra layer of security. A recent study actually showed a 30% drop in the support of the death penalty when the alternative sentence was a life sentence without parole, plus restitution. Other substitutes include anti-violence programs and support groups for the prevention of child abuse and domestic violence. Counseling and compensation can reassure the surviving family members of homicides. Drug courts and substance abuse treatment programs, as well as mental health courts and community-based mental health treatment programs, can be employed to prevent homicides in the first place. Restorative justice programs such as victim offender mediation and facilitated dialogue can lessen tension between murderers and the families of their victims, reducing the financially strenuous appeals process. Even if offender re-entry programs were implemented nationwide, capital punishment will continue to occur, but its frequency can decrease by taking such preventative measures. Judicial officials should put aside their personal agendas and instead pursue the most economically and morally feasible course of action, giving offenders life without parole instead of the death penalty. But this shift will be difficult because there's a lot at stake for those who aren't even involved in the execution. <laughs>